good morning, everyone. So, welcome to the quantum theory course. So, my name is Fernando, and I will be your lecturer over the next, uh, hopefully, if you attend all the lectures, over the next 16 lectures. So, this course will be about quantum theory, and I will start by telling you three things, three important things about quantum theory or quantum mechanics, as they call it in, in other places. So the, the first thing about quantum mechanics is that this theory is the most fundamental theory of, of physics. And all modern theories, actually, all the theories over the last 50, 60, 70 years, are actually built upon quantum mechanics. Any theory, to be consistent, it has to agree with quantum mechanics. The second point, which is also very important, is that quantum mechanics, at least for us, will be very counterintuitive. As we will see, the need for quantum mechanics arose because we have understood that all the theories, all the, phys all the laws that we knew from classical mechanics actually fail when we are talking about a very small scale. And because of that, people needed to develop a new theory. But because our intuition comes from classical mechanics, all of you know what happens if I throw this pen. I do this and the throw falls, this won't be true in quantum mechanics anymore. So quantum mechanics is very counterintuitive because it doesn't agree with our intuition, which is based on classical physics. And the third point, which is also very important, especially for you as mathematicians, is that we will not give a first principles derivation. And the reason for that is not because I am lazy. I am a bit lazy. But that's not the reason why I will not give a first principle derivation. But the reason is that actually no one can. So quantum mechanics is just based on experiments. We do some experiments we see that nature behaves at an atomic scale in a crazy way, and we try to build a mathematical theory that agrees with these observations. Then we try to do predictions. These predictions over the last one billion experiments happen actually to be true, so we believe in quantum mechanics. But there is no way in which I am going to derive quantum mechanics for you. Okay? So instead, we will uh, describe briefly the experiments that have led to quantum mechanics, and then we will try to present the formalism of quantum mechanics, and we will see what the implications of quantum mechanics are. Is that OK? Now, as for material for this course, this course is based on three things. So for you first, you have the lecture notes that you can see in, in the Mathematical Institute webpage. Then we also have the lectures uh, by Feynman. So they are called the Feynman lectures. They are beautiful books. And the volume three is the one that deals with uh, quantum mechanics. And then we have another classic book, which is the book by Landau and Lipschitz. Now, this book is a book that you should not read unless you already know quantum mechanics. And even if you know quantum mechanics, it will confuse you. And it's still the best book ever written. But I have to tell you, 
So this is the volume three, and a disclaimer, read it at your own risk. Your. Is that okay? And after my lectures, every time I will stay outside for 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, you can ask me as many questions as you want. Feel also free to stop me in the lecture, right? If something I am saying is not very clear for you, then you just stop me, tell me, Fernando, why is that? Why is this? Is that okay? You can also drop me an email, so feel free to stop me at any time. Maybe it's a bit too early, but do you have any questions now? Fantastic. So, as I was uh, just mentioning, the motivation for quantum mechanics is basically the failure of classical physics. So basically, all the physics that you have learned so far at the atomic scale. By the way, is, people, uh, is the font large enough for people in the back? Yeah, fantastic. Then, what we will start to do today will be, we will start by reviewing two of the basic concepts of classical mechanics. And I will just remind you of a few things that you have already learned. And then, over the next few lectures, we will shatter all these concepts that we have learned so far. But first, I want to just, we are on the same page. We will learn, we will re remind about point particles and waves and the equations that govern them. Okay? So all these things are things that you have seen, but let me remind you uh, a few things um, so that we, we can build quantum mechanics and we can understand the experiments, why they are so crazy. So first, we have the concept of point particle. A point particle is a particle the size of a point, which at a given time is in a specific position. Okay? So, is an idealized object of zero size, right? And basically, we say that at any time, the point particle is at some location r, which depends on the time t, OK? Then we know that the position is governed by the second law of Newton, so it satisfies the following equation. For constant mass, so let's assume that the particle has constant mass, you know that the mass times the acceleration of the particle, which is the second derivative of r with respect to t, is equal to the force acting on the particle. OK? In this course, we will consider uh, what is called a conservative force. Okay. 
That is, the force as a function of r, r sorry, will be the gradient of some v, and this v, which is a function of r, is called the potential. And furthermore, in this, uh, in this course, we will consider the case of static potential And this simply means that B of R is independent of T, of the time T. OK? If we have this situation, uh, a well-known result that you have derived in, um, in dynamics, or even in high school, is that the total energy of the particle is actually conserved. And by definition, the total energy of the particle is the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, or this uh, potential. So R is a vector dr dt is a vector 2. By this, we just mean the dot product of dr dt with itself, OK? Or the normal square of the vector dr dt. And here, um, this piece is called the kinetic energy. And this one is called the potential energy. OK? You have seen all this, right? Now, the, the computation that shows that the energy is actually conserved is very simple, but is uh, a bit instructive. So you can take DEDT, and just from the definition, this is M. the RDT the second derivative the RDT square and in the second piece we have simply DVDT now we say that V doesn't depend on T what we really mean so V depends on R but of course the R for a particle depends on T Right? So it depends on time through R. And by using the chain rule, we can write this down as M dr dt dot d squared R dt squared. Here we are using the chain rule. plus the gradient of B, dr dt. But then, by definition, uh, so this is a vector, and we take the dot product of this vector with dr dt. But we remember that by definition of potential, the gradient of the potential is minus the force. So this is equal to dr dt dot m, the second derivative of r respect to t squared, minus the force. But our friend Isaac Newton tells us that this is actually zero. So the vector product with zero is zero. So the energy is conserved. Is that OK? Now, then there is another thing, another two little things. So we have also learned that the momentum of the particle uh, is 
what we denoted, what we usually denote by P is equal to M dr dt. And in terms of this momentum, the kinetic energy of the particle can be written as p squared over 2m, right? And finally, let me tell you uh, another name. Remember that if there is no force over a particle, then we call this a free particle. Is that okay? Fantastic. Is everyone happy with this? Right? Great. And people was happy with all these two. Okay? So they were, you know, in the late 1800s, they were quite happy with all this. Now, let me tell you something about this. So the first point, the first small note, is that as we will see, all this works only for massive particles. which do not move very fast. As we will see, it happens actually that in nature, there are massless particles, and there are also particles that move at a speed very close to the speed of light, and for these particles, these kind of formulas don't actually work, okay? You can already see a problem here of what do you do with this if the particle is massless. We will come back to that later. The second note, and, and it's more important for what we are going to, to say next, not two, this is actually uh, important, is that the point particle moves in a deterministic way. In other words, if you have a particle, you know the location and the velocity of the particle at some point, you could just take Mathematica or whatever, if you know the force, you could compute what the trajectory of the particle is, okay? So if I am here and someone push me from my left, you know immediately that I will move here, and I am, not, I am far from being a point particle, but if I was a point particle, you could use the second law of Newton to see which acceleration I will get, okay? And, and uh, then we say that classical physics, classical mechanics, is actually uh, completely deterministic. Then, the, another, the other important point is that E can take any real value. Okay? So, if I am in my car, my car is still the kinetic energy of my car is zero, I start accelerating my car, it acquires kinetic energy, but the kinetic energy grows in a continuous way, okay? And I can tune the velocity, choose the velocity, in such a way that the energy takes any real value, okay? With the correct units. So, E can take any real value, and it's also something continuous. Is that okay? Is everybody happy with that? So this is all what I am going to say about um, the point particle. So basically we have the concept of energy, we have 
the fact that it follows a deterministic law, that is the second law of Newton, and also its energy can take any real value. And the kinetic energy, for instance, is always positive or non-negative, and, and all these things are known things. Is that okay? The second concept, which I want to describe today, is the concept of waves. So waves describe, for instance, the propagation of light or sound. Waves are described but we, but by what we call the classical wave equation and this is just 1 over v square, the second derivative of phi with respect to t square is equal to the Laplacian acting on phi. And in this equation, you have seen this with, uh, with the strings in Fourier, for instance. This V here is called, is the speed of the wave, okay? So you have seen this in Fourier, right? In partial differential equations, that, that course. Do you remember what the solution to these sort of equations are, is? What are the solutions? Can you tell me? You are being recorded, so they will think you don't know what uh, the wave equation is. So, the solution is like sines and cosines, right? And it is very nice to... to so, sines and cosines. And we can repackage them into the following. So phi of r and t is equal to some amplitude times the exponential of i. I will tell what all these things are. Okay, r minus omega t. Now, this type of solutions uh, is called a plane wave. Notice that if you take real and imaginary part of these plane waves, you go back to the sines and cosines that you are used to. This A in front is called the amplitude. Amplitude. And in principle, may be complex. Then this vector k here is called the wave vector. And basically, it describes the direction in which the waves move. So this wave moves, propagates, in the direction of this vector k. Then we have this omega here, and this omega here is called the frequency. Okay? Now what we do, we take this ansatz and we plug it into the wave equation. We, we just do that, so notice that when you take two derivatives with respect to time, you will bring down an omega square, but, and we have the i as well. So on the left-hand side, we get minus omega square over v square. And on the right-hand side, we take the Laplacian. Each one, uh, when we take the, the gradient, we, we have k, and if we take it Twice, we have k squared, okay? So, this gives us a relation 
between the velocity, the speed, sorry, the speed, the frequency, and the norm of this wave number k. Okay? Notice in particular that the frequency for fixed wave number is proportional to the, to the velocity. Then we have um, two other uh, things of notation. So sometimes it is important, uh, people will talk about instead of, sorry, so this one sometimes is called the angular frequency, omega, and you can also talk about the wave frequency. And the wave frequency, eta, is omega over 2 pi. And we have also the wavelength, and the wavelength, lambda, is 2 pi over the norm of k. So for instance, from these two things, you can see that the velocity, you can write it as the wave frequency times the wavelength, OK? Because the two pi's cancel each other. The two two pi's cancel each other. Is that OK? Any questions about this? So this is like a very brief review of, of things that you have seen before, but, uh, but still, they are very important. And very much like before, we have that the, the dynamics that controls waves is still deterministic so it so happens that actually every solution to the wave equation can be written as a linear combination of these plane waves so these plane waves are a basis of solutions and once you have done that you know the time dependence of your wave. And in addition, something that I have not uh, explained, but again, the energy is continuous in this model. Is that OK? Great. So this was the view. So I needed, sorry, I needed to bore you uh, with this. But this was the situation of physics about 100 years ago. And people with these two laws, they have either waves, they have particles, and waves satisfy the wave equation. Particles satisfy the second law of Newton. And everything was fine. But then there were three experiments. And these three experiments changed, actually, completely our vision of physics at the atomic level. So now we will describe three experiments that change the world. First experiment. In the first experiment, it is something that you can try at home. Well, you can do the classical version at home. So imagine that you have a bowl of cereal, right? This is milk. And in the milk, you have some cereal. But you shouldn't use beta wicks. You should use these hoops. Right? These hoop cereals. And then what you do, maybe with a straw or something, you spit milk on the bowl of cereal. OK? That's something your mom will love this, but uh, you, you can do this. So you start uh, spitting milk. And if you spit milk really, really fast and strong, some of these cereals will just be emitted from this. Right? And it's actually something that is true, that if you do it really fast and super strongly, the emitted cereal will go really far. 
OK? Fantastic. <laughs> so now we are going to do a slightly more fancy version of that experiment. But basically, it's the same. So we will take a metal plate. So this is metal. And this metal has some electrons on it. E minus, E minus, E minus, E minus, E minus. And then we get a laser, OK? And with our laser, we shoot this metal plate. So here you have your laser. So this is light. And this is light of frequency omega. OK? So you buy your laser, you adjust to have frequency omega, and then you just shoot your plate, your metal plate, that has a lot of electrons on it. And what will happen is that exactly as the serial over there, some electrons will be emitted. This experiment is called the photoelectric effect. And the question we want to answer in this, uh, in this experiment is, what is the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons. OK? So basically, if we go to, to, our, to the experiments we can do with our laser, basically, you want to spit milk, and then you are asking how far the cereal reaches. OK? So here, the question to ask is, we have our metal with electrons. We shoot it with a laser with light of angular frequency omega. And we ask, what is the kinetic energy? Some electrons will be emitted. And we ask, what is the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons? OK? Great. So far, so good. It happens what people discovered was actually something quite surprising. And what they discovered was that the energy, the kinetic energy of the electrons was equal to some energy minus some energy is zero plus some constant times omega, the frequency of the light that you are shooting. So this is a constant. So this depends on the metal. And this one here is another constant. You have to read this constant as h bar. It's also h divided 2 pi, but no one more, no one uh, anymore uses h. So we always use h bar. And this constant is actually very fundamental in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics. We will see it over and over again. And it has some value. It's not very important, but it's important that it's quite small. So it's 1.05 10 to the minus 34 joules 
times second. And the, the surprising thing that, that people have found was the following. So first, if the frequency of the laser is smaller than E0 divided by H bar, then no electrons are emitted. That's OK. I mean, it's quite cool. What we are saying is that if that formula is true, the kinetic energy of electrons cannot be negative. Indeed, quantum theory is crazy, but not that crazy. So it's good that, that at least we get this. But this is the result of an experiment, and people was happy with this. But more importantly, the kinetic energy is independent of the intensity of the laser. And this is completely crazy. We are saying that if we have a laser that is 10 times more powerful, the kinetic energy of the electrons will still be the same. The only thing that happens is that more electrons are emitted, but each electron has actually the same kinetic energy minus E0 plus H bar omega. Just to see on the left hand side, it means that if you spit milk, no matter how strong it is, these cereals, the hoops, always go the same distance far away. Okay? So either they are not emitted or they are always emitted to the same distance. Okay? Um, and actually, if you, if you have a look at the classical theory of Maxwell, that was the accepted theory of, of light and electromagnetism, Maxwell cannot explain these observations. Crazy, these observations. Then came along Einstein. And Einstein said, what if light of angular frequency omega is made up of tiny quanta of energy E h bar omega. And if this is true, right, we will see in a second how the, we explain the results of that experiment. But it turns out, so this would be what we call photons. And photons are massless particles that move at the speed of light. Off. Ah, sorry. I just erase one of the most important. 
things uh, that move at the speed of light. Then the explanation, so how this explains our results, is because the electrons, so the electrons, the E minus, absorb one photon, right? Then they use E zero to overcome the binding energy of the metal. So a metal is like a country that requires visa to get out. So you have to pay a little bit if you want to get out of a metal. And this is the binding energy, E0. And then they started with this energy, H bar omega. Then they use E0 to overcome the binding energy of the metal. And finally, they remain, they get away. with the remaining energy. energy. Einstein got the Nobel Prize for this explanation. And there is a lot of crazy things about this explanation. Notice that first, the first was the crazy idea that actually light which was always believed to be a wave, and that's it, is actually made up of tiny particles, okay? But also, these particles are very special because they are particles that they travel at the speed of light, as you will learn next year in general relativity, uh, if you take that option. Uh, you will see that the only particles that can travel at the speed of light are massless particles. And also notice that the energy of these particles is proportional to the frequency or to the velocity. Well, usually for massive particles, the kinetic energy is proportional to the square of the velocity. That's not true for, for these uh, photons, okay? So this was the first experiment, and it was important because it is showing us that actually the sometimes light can behave as a particle. And the example was the example of the photoelectric, um, photoelectric effect. Let me describe now the second experiment. So the second experiment, experiment two, is about emission and absorption spectra of atoms. Atoms uh, have this very curious uh, feature, and it's the fact that they emit absorbed light with very particular frequencies. In other words, if you have a gas of a given atom, hydrogen, helium, and you throw light to it, most of the frequencies will just go through. But some specific frequencies will be absorbed by the atom. And these are the same frequencies that the gas will emit as well. Okay? 
And of course, people were very surprised by this fact. But it, it is a bit hard to make this uh, something quantitative. But then they realized that for the hydrogen atom, which is the simplest atom that one can consider, the frequencies satisfied a beautiful law. And they depend on two natural numbers, n1 and n2. And this was equal to a constant, 2 pi r0 times the speed of light, 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. So here, uh, n1 is smaller than n2. The size of the frequencies are always positive. This is the speed of light, c. And this, uh, well, it, it is some number. I, I don't care too much about numbers, uh, meters to the minus 1. And this is called the right bearers constant. If someone in the street asks you what the right bearers constant is, you know. So it's this constant here. Imagine how hard it is to come up with such a formula, right? I mean, you are an experimentalist, and you have numbers, right? You have a lot of numbers. And then you just try a lot of formulas, because there is a lot of trial and error. And, error. and at the end of the day, you find out that all the numbers you found follow this pattern. OK? It's quite cool, actually. And then, so this was actually discovered long ago, so in 1888. But then, this is not, OK, it's, it's a result. But now, we can think, what is the meaning of experiment one together with experiment two, right? We know that light is made up of photons, right? So we can imagine that the atom of hydrogen absorbs these photons, OK? But these photons don't have random energies. They have some energy that uh, we, we know. And what that means, so experiment one plus the explanation by Einstein implies that the photons emitted, absorbed by this hydrogen atom have energy h bar, omega, and 1 and 2, right? Because these are the frequencies that we are observing. And this is consistent with the result of the experiment, provided if the possible energies of the hydrogen atom are En equals minus 2 pi R0 C H bar over n square. And then what happens if we assume that the energy uh, levels of the hydrogen atom can only be these, what happens is that when the hydrogen atom jumps from one of these levels to another level, it emits an electron with the difference. OK? Or if it absorbs an electron of the right, a photon, sorry, a photon. If it absorbs a photon of the right frequency, then it will um, emit a photon of that, uh, 
of that um, frequency over there. Is that okay? This was something absolutely crazy. So people couldn't believe that. Like all the examples in physics that we have known so far, the energy is something continuous, right? You can have 0, 0 0.02, 0 0.00221, like whatever real number, you can have that energy. The hydrogen atom cannot. And the energies of the hydrogen atom are actually given by the inverse of perfect squares. How cool is that? So this was absolutely crazy and cool at the same time. And one of the biggest successes of what will be our aim in this course is to derive that formula. We will write down the axioms, the principles of quantum mechanics, and we will derive this formula, and we will be all super happy about it. I will be super happy. But um, so this was also one of the biggest successes of quantum mechanics to derive this formula. But basically, this formula tells us that, OK, things are very different to how we thought they were. Now, there is experiment three that we, I will explain at the beginning of next uh, lecture, which is also very crazy. So we have seen in experiment one that sometimes light behaves as it was, if it was particle, a particle, the photon in this case. We will actually see an experiment in which it is clear that some particles also behave like waves. And things that you thought were particles are, are, um, are actually waves. And that tells us that actually we need to reconsider all the things that we have learned in classical mechanics. Thank you.